Um, we started, uh, there's been so much content, you've probably forgotten some things, uh, so perhaps I'll refresh your memories, particularly for the first day. I, at this point, I think it's necessary for me to say that I am now going to completely destroy all those beautiful presentations that some people spent weeks preparing and worrying about, and I'm going to zip through them so quickly that I will quite understand if the people who made the original presentations are terribly hurt because I didn't bring out all the most important points that they thought. But we don't have much time. I have two days to to summarize in, you know, half an hour, if that. So please be tolerant, and I've picked out what I think are the most important things. And I'm sorry if I didn't give as much emphasis to, as I say, some beautifully prepared presentations. So Noah came from America. He's, um, as you know, the director of the um, uh, Armory Show. And he pointed out, he started out by just giving us a little overview of the market, and particularly this size. I mean, this has been one of the, the things. I mean, he talked a lot about the key shifts in the market, and one of the key shifts is the fact that the market, particularly for modern and contemporary art, has just exploded, uh, doubled since 1998. Um, the other key shift has been globalization, and I'm going to come back at the end to this, to all the Asians that we have been looking at, globalization, obviously, and the rise of China, he emphasized that, and of course Claire did that as well. Um, and not exactly a decline, because it's a growing market, but um, uh, the US-EU axis is no longer as important as it was. Um, he talked about the, the fact that the market today is so event-driven and, of course, you know, this tsunami of art fairs that we're all living, you know, it goes from, I think, 19, 1970, there were three major art fairs and the figures vary, it depends what's major, but it could be 200 at least today and it seems to be more every week I get another email saying there's a new fair. We've also seen a colossal evolution in auction houses, you know, with them moving into private sales and having their own selling spaces, which is a big problem for galleries. Um, and But we've also seen a blurring the other way, is that dealers, particularly the big ones, are putting on non-selling shows and sometimes very, very good ones. Of course, they are basically selling the gallery, but they're selling the brand. Um, oh, sorry, I had to do it quite quickly, so we have already discussed that. Um, So Noah gave us a little bit of crystal ball gazing. What's the future? Um, One of the things is obviously the rising cost, and this is something that other speakers have mentioned uh, as well. So the need for galleries to make strategic choices, for instance, what fairs they do. Um, He predicts that the blurring of boundaries will continue, so that the not-for-profit or the non-commercial and the commercial overlapping more. He obviously looks, I mean, the internet is terribly important. He thinks it will grow. His crystal ball says it will grow, but not at a very high level, with which I personally very much agree with him. What's nice is the decentralization of, of, of the marketplaces, not just London and New York, but Reykjavik and Barcelona. Why not? Um, so decentralization, and I think that's also because it's a, a growing market still. And um, he said, "Don't you can't be nostalgic. The past won't come back. And the linear model, the old model for art, um, art to, to running art uh, as galleries, is uh, moving from this much simpler structure towards a much more multi-layered structure." We then had the great pleasure of having Albert Barognon, who was celebrating as well this year his 40 years in the trade. Um, so uh, we heard a little bit what it was like when you started out 40 years ago, you could start out with $250 in your own living room. I mean, practically, well, hotel in London did it as well, so it's probably still possible, but not with $250. Um, and he started in, in Brussels, where there was there, it was a tiny, as was the art world uh, for contemporary art 40 years ago. It was a much smaller market, very few committed. Uh, the com- com- collectors who did exist were committed, but um, there weren't that many of them, there were no museums. Um, And for him, it was a political engagement. He hoped that art would change society. I think 40 years ago, there was a more democratic, I think, you know, there's a rise of editions and there was a much more democratic desire in those days. Perhaps we don't have that today. Uh, He also noticed no art advisors. We didn't talk about art advisors, but that's been an important change. Um, 
he says that today, we're looking to today, uh, you obviously need much more money for everything, but even, I mean, he recounted that he had his little uh, Renault 4, I think, that was yellow, and he just piled the art on top of it, off, off, on top of it and off he went. Um, this just doesn't happen today. The logistics are more, co everything's more complicated. Um, of course, getting into art fairs, he was amongst the founders of the Brussels Art Fair. Um, and it's, you know, it's as we all know, it's very, very difficult to, to get into art fairs today. It was not the case when he started. Um, and of course, the big problem is that there are so many fairs that there's much more pressure on the artist. And this is a problem we haven't discussed much, but is very relevant, I think, to today's art market. And of course, he noted that Brussels has become a much more important center. But he says, stay focused on what you do, believe in what you do, and keep doing it. It's fine. Just believe in yourself, which I think is always good um, advice. Um, we then had the panel about the relevance of galleries. Um, Janine Hofland also saying the same thing. Be strategic. You have to make choices when you're a small gallery. Um, and you need to emphasize your space and emphasize the relationship with artists. Um, we had Victor Giesler, who does not want to be a super tanker, which is nice. Uh, he points out that the art world is a people-to-people -people business, and people don't. A lot of artists don't want just to make product to show in art fairs. That you know, they want to work with a gallerist. Um, the artists know their careers and their minds, and. It's important the galleries, the sort of USP, the unique selling point for the gallery, is that it is his knowledge, and he, you know he should you should try to brand that. The anonymous auction houses can't provide that. Uh, Lisa Panting from Hollybush Gardens, um, when she started, and there's another young gallery, 65% uh, of their artists were exclusive to them, and they had as many women as men. And she said that the shows are not just for the short-term return. You have to take a long view, and I think that's, that's always good advice. Communications is one of the things that is emphasized right through the two days. You need to communicate with curators, institutions, and, of course, bring people into the galleries um, with brunches. Get, if, if she said, if you can get people in for 30 minutes, get their attention for 30 minutes, it makes a big difference. And I think that's a very good lesson. Uh, she did create this fair gallery, but it wasn't commercially successful, so that's slightly gone into abeyance. Then we had a presentation by Alain Servé, uh, in which he said, you know, the fact is, get over the fact that things are changing. Everything changes. Look at Swiss watches in the 80s. It was dying because of Japan, and he gave a lot of other examples. Um, you need to change with the times and reinvent yourself, and it's possible to do so. I mean, watches are a huge market today. Swiss watches are a huge market, so don't give up. Um, you can't go against the trends, um, and don't brand the mega galleries as the bad boys. That's the way it is. That's competition, and you have to find a new way of working. Um, another one of the things that's terribly important that's come out all through the two days has been professionalization. You know, it, it is more, it's a, a more complex world, a more complex market, and professionalization is terribly important, and that we came back to it today, those of you who are here talking about the contracts. Uh, it's, it's just the world is more litigious, the money is bigger, and so it's important to professionalize. Use the internet better. We were lucky to have Billy, who gave an excellent presentation. Um, you know, speak languages, learn English. Um, look at your opening times. Um, and look outside the box, you know, look at what other businesses are doing. For example, try to use crowdfunding if necessary. And cooperation, another thing that's come out a lot, work together, work with other galleries. Cooperation is also super important. Communication, cooperation, these are really, everyone came back to the same things, professionalization. Um, then we had a presentation which was looking from the other side, from the side of the consumer, if you like. And um, I know Grandes pointed out that a lot of people haven't even visited her institution but are offering works of art, so they don't even know what she shows. And I think that's very fundamental for galleries to you know, know who you're working with. And Maria de Corral believes so much in galleries, but she needs the galleries. It's the same argument, know who you're talking to. And she said, I'm fr it's not a mistake. I am fried with information, she said, but it's not always the right information. So don't just blanket bomb with um, emails. Try to adapt the email to the person. 
and Emilio says also he's not getting enough information. So information is coming over is very key as well. Uh, so too many emails which I've mentioned. Personalized things. People who buy art want to f want the follow-up. They'd like to know if an artist they've bought, if they've got an exhibition coming up, if they're in a show, if there's a catalogue. So that is something to do. Um, and as I say, know about the institution before contacting. And there was quite a quite a discussion about the discounts. Um, galleries have individual uh, positions on that, and it's a delicate subject, the whole subject of pricing we didn't really explore. Um, but it's worth thinking about how much you should give and whether you pr preferred clients or whether you should increase your prices in order to discount, and it's quite an individual problem. Kamel Manoa, it's rather difficult for me to talk about the talk with him because I was talking to him, so I was unable to make notes, So, and my memory is like a goldfish. So uh, anyway, all I do remember is that his, I think that his multicultural background makes it easier for him to work with artists. He does believe that you need constant personal investment in, your, in working with artists. He's been very successful in working with artists. But he did lose one and he did separate for another one. And this is always a, a painful, something painful. He certainly lived uh, the separation with Adele Abdesimed. As he said, so it took him six months to recover. And I can think of other cases when artists have been poached. And it's hard for the dealer. You know, you do live it as a betrayal and a divorce. Um, but he says you get over it and you learn from it. Um, he said that he had, uh, he has now two big spaces but doesn't want to extend internationally. So not everyone wants to become a jumbo gallery or a mega gallery. And he also doesn't show any painter, but he'd love to find a painter. So. Uh, Jocelyn Wolfe was totally confronting the system, um, uh, saying, point, for a start, giving us transparency, which is something sadly lacking in the art world, um, and gave us actually how much he makes, which was very interesting. Um, and uh, he believes that the values of the art market in many ways are, are quite reactionary. Um, but he pointed out that the art gallery is today, with the hordes of people you see in the Louvre or in the British Museum, that actually an art gallery is a lovely contemplative space where you can spend time with works of art. Um, and he believes that a dealer can promote art, which is challenging. You know, you have to invest yourself. And he believes that the scale of the market has changed is obviously completely changed. But the rest of the market functions very much as it did before. And this is actually, it's interesting, this is a thesis, it's, it's slightly um, uh, academic, but there are other commentators who are far cleverer than I am who also believe that the fundamentals of the art market haven't changed, even if the scale and the globalization has come in. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting, he said, if you can offer strong artists for less money, you know that that will help your gallery as a small one. And he did actually throw into the mix the thought that you could perhaps rethink the pricing model and return to the old way when the dealer, Louis Carré, uh, dealer bought everything and then sold it. But uh, I don't know how applicable that is to today's world. So we had a fantastic presentation this morning from Claire McAndrew, which was it's just impossible to summarize. Um, and it was so thorough. Um, and she does give us some figures in a very difficult to know what's happening in the world. As she, she did in the world of the, of the art market anyway. Um, she also obviously talked about globalization, which has sort of flattened out because of globalization in the 19... In 1990, when the market collapsed, it was because Japan was the major buyer. Today's world is different. There's much more globalization. There's buyers in China, in the Middle East, and in uh, Brazil, in Latin America, now a bit in Africa as well. So this has prevented these fantastic peaks and, and drops, uh, which, is, which is a good thing. Um, and she even sees China, which after its boom and to an extent bust, it wasn't really a bust, but there was a drop. It was a bit of a bubble. She sees it returning to stability. She thinks that the global wealth, uh, which she pointed out, will bring in more clients for art, which is good news for galleries. And she does note that most transactions still are not at the mega level, not at the millions, but they're under 50,000 um, uh, euros. But she noticed that the whole dealer model has changed the way it was. You know, you used to buy cheap and sell expensive, and that was about it. And now there's more competition, obviously, and there's more content that the dealers have to 
produce to add into what they're doing. And we, as we know, it's difficult for the retail gallery. Um, it is in decline. Um, that the market is fair, as we also discussed earlier, yes, and as we discussed yesterday, the market is event-driven. Um, the internet, obviously, is the great question. She puts a figure on it of $3 billion. Um, that is difficult to quantify. Um, it can only be an estimate, um, but the internet seems to be, the sales seem to be at the middle and low end of the market. And she pointed out that galleries still have pluses. They offer specialized expertise, they offer services, um, and they're personal. And whereas the auction houses are much more impersonal, they're, they're, they're a company and they're not a person. We then had a fantastic pre um, presentation by Sylvain Lévy about China, in which he sort of set the scene by saying, you know, China in 2005 has its first pavilion at the Venice Biennale. This year there were 350 Chinese artists. I saw some, I saw all of them, uh, well, most of them. It was uneven, it has to be said, very uneven. Um, but the Chinese artists are definitely uh, influenced by Western culture, enormously so, but it is a love-hate relationship. So there is, at the same time, they're borrowing from it, but at the same time, they sort of uh, don't like it as well, which is an interesting thing going on. Um, he pointed out that censorship is not the most important problem, speaking about Ai Weiwei, but it's political expediency that makes decisions about who goes to jail. He pointed out that the Nobel Prize winner for literature is still in jail. Ai Weiwei isn't because it's a political decision, not a censorship decision. He pointed out the Chinese pragmatism. Um, and so you can't say the Chinese are like this because they will behave in a pra pragmatic way. Um, he pointed out how important networking and contacts are. Um, he believes in a huge potential for this market and also that China is interested in art because it's a way of counteracting negative views of China. It's soft power, art, culture are soft power and they're encouraging, for example, children through the, um, um, the cultural organization whose name I've just forgotten. Um, but they are using it to, to encourage the teaching of Chinese outside China. So this is a, something that's long term, but in a generation there will be many more people speaking Chinese out China, outside China. And of course you have the arrival of the foreign auction houses um, who are treated as crocodiles because they're going to stimulate all the other fish. But of course the big question is will ultimately the fish, i.e. the Chinese auction houses and the Chinese dealers, eat the crocodile, i.e. Sotheby's Christie's and the other foreign auction houses who've come in. Um, we then discussed um, art fairs with Kleis um, Nodenhaker, uh, who noted that sometimes, and it was an interesting point, that the very big galleries can use fairs to stake out new markets. It didn't actually happen in Bolivia, but it has happened in other South American markets. He talked a bit about the gallery weekend in Berlin, which is a big success, so a way of bringing people into the galleries, and for, for not a huge cost, because the 7,000 euros covers all the publicity, the dinner, bringing people in, the maps, and it is a successful event. Um, ABC Art Berlin Contemporary, which is a little bit more like an art fair, except that it's solo shows, but in a place is more problematic. And he believes that Barcelona should perhaps be thinking of having a gallery weekend like, like the Berlin in building it up. Um, we then had Adrian Rembrandt um, from FEAGA who told us what he's doing in order to support um, the, uh, the galleries, lobbying on artists' resale right, droit de suite, which is a big problem for a lot of galleries. Working for harmonization of VAT, which is ridiculous, it's different from one country to the other, so he's also there working to try to get at least that harmonized, working on intellectual rights. And he encourages gallerists to join your national uh, association, whatever it is, in order to work together and to push for reforms of things that are important to the profession. Um, so the last two panels, um, you've probably just heard, so I'll go through them quite quickly. Um, I thought the code of practice was really interesting because it sort of fell into two, two sides. One side was people who feel that using contracts in art galleries is really not 
uh, maybe the market is not really ready for it because of the structure of the market, because it's very individualistic nature. Also, if you do have a long-term relationship with a, with, um, uh, with an artist, um, then it's difficult to suddenly turn around and say, right, 13 years, now I'm going to make a, make a contract with you. So that is one problem. Most galleries from a sort of straw poll, most galleries here don't have contracts for their artists. There's always this fear of deteriorating relationships with clients, with artists. People don't terribly like lawyers. Um, and some people just feel that the art world shouldn't be over-regulated. It is still a work, personal, and um, a still work of handshakes. On the other hand, the other side was that younger artists are more open to contracts. Um, and that in uh, the, the big boys do have contracts, huge contracts. So this is slightly the way is the way it's going. The life is more complex, and particularly if artists are shared, those more complex relationships mean that contracts will be necessary. Um, there was a very interesting discussion about whether art fairs, uh, art fairs as a sort of outside person, could in some way. Um, impose some sort of a contract so that the problem of people promising to buy works of art and then not following through could be in some way resolved. And I think there was no real conclusion. And we had a representative from Art Basel who seemed to think that it was not very realizable. The problem is who would enforce it, really. And, you know, if somebody, whether they sign the piece of paper or not, would they actually pay? Um, these sort of contracts are very difficult, particularly if you have a relationship with a, with a collector anyway. Um, but it was pointed out that in other creative fields like music or theatre, you know, contracts are completely the rule. So perhaps one day the art world needs to move, move up its, um, raise its game a notch and also become more professionalised. Uh, we come back always to the same things, communications, professionalisation. And finally, we had a very interesting presentation, which I think really interested everyone, about, um, about using the internet and particularly your website. Um, very, Billy told us that galleries, for a start, really need to think hard about their needs before deciding what they want to do. Uh, and I think his advice was taking time, testing things like, for example, languages, see what you need before you really commit to, to the way you're going to go for your website. The same thing for your blog. If you want to blog, test it in the gallery first. He had a lot of suggestions for free or very cheap tools that you could embed in your website um, so that there are ways of making your website look fantastically professional but actually not really costing you very much at all, if anything terribly important to be consistent that right across the materials of the gallery, you know, to have the same typeface, obviously, and to be consistent in your website so that the whole thing flows and gives an identity and a brand to the gallery. Um, use social media, it's obvious, but again, um, be consistent in everything you do. So thank you very much. We have some of our speakers still here. Um, and if you have questions, um, we would like to, we're very happy to take questions. And if you, for the speakers, there are perhaps questions you wanted to ask during their presentations you weren't able to, now is the opportunity. <coughs> Otherwise, you can all go and have a glass of cover immediately. That's the alternative. I don't know if that's a very good thing to say because <laughs> I don't want to encourage you too much. <laughs> Okay, well, time for the cover. <laughs> Am I still, uh, can I, just one more thing I'm, I meant to say. Um, in fact, two more things I meant to say, sorry. One is that there is a person here who came to the first Talking Galleries. She comes from Sweden. She has a very small gallery. After that, after listening to the two days, um, she felt that it was possible for her to change her way of practicing, that her problems, the problems that she would have in a small gallery, were exactly the same as the problem of a bigger gallery. 
And when she got back to Sweden, she found another space in a cluster of bigger galleries. She was able to work with some of the artists she'd hoped to work with but hadn't been able to work with in her smaller space. And so she has now got a bigger space in an area that she wanted to be in. It's not profit-making yet, but the smaller gallery is supporting her. And it was entirely due to what she learned and heard at the first talk in galleries. So I think it's a fantastic approbation that, uh, that she was able to do this as a result of what she heard. Um, and that was all the speakers. And something else I had to say. Something else I was on. Something else. No? See you at the next Talking Galleries. <laughs>